Final Fantasy Adventure is one of the most epic games for the original Game Boy. If you like The Legend of Zelda, you'll find a lot to love here. A large world to explore, dungeons with puzzles to solve, and tons of bosses to fight. You may think this game ripped off a lot of its ideas from Zelda, but it actually came out several months before A Link to the Past on the Super Nintendo, and two years before Link's Awakening on the Game Boy. Final Fantasy Adventure was developed by Squaresoft, and originally it had nothing to do with Final Fantasy. Square began working on a game in 1987 titled Saiken Densetsu, which roughly translates to Legend of the Sacred Sword. It was going to be a massive adventure game for the Famicom Disk System in Japan, and was planned to come on five discs. The absurd number of discs is probably why it got cancelled, and Square sent an official letter to customers who had pre-ordered the game to inform them of the cancellation, and to also promote another game they were releasing later that year, the original Final Fantasy. A few years later and the Final Fantasy series had become Square's most popular game franchise. In Japan, they had released three games in the series, and the original was a hit in North America as well. They decided to revisit the idea of Saiken Densetsu, but this time they retooled it to be a Final Fantasy spin-off on the Game Boy. The new game was titled Saiken Densetsu Final Fantasy Gaiden, and one of the designers from the original Final Fantasy, Koichi Ishii, was given the opportunity to direct. He designed all of the new characters himself, and then added in elements familiar to the Final Fantasy series. There are red and black mages, familiar looking towns, chocobos, and even moogles. Considering that we didn't get Final Fantasy 2 or 3, the games that we got on the Super Nintendo are actually Final Fantasy 4 and 6, this was the first time we'd seen chocobos or moogles in the United States. For players in Europe where the game was retitled Mystic Quest, this was the first time any Final Fantasy game had been officially released on the continent. The gameplay is similar to Zelda, but as a Final Fantasy game, it does feature more RPG elements like the ability to level up your character and choose how his attributes increase. There is also a rich story that Ishii worked on with Yoshinori Kitase, who would go on to direct Final Fantasy VI, VII, VIII, and IX, as well as Chrono Trigger. The game was quite popular when it released in North America in November of 1991, delivering a deep gameplay experience that was uncommon on the old monochromatic Game Boy. The world created in this game was so popular it spawned an entirely new franchise. The sequel, Saiken Densetsu 2, was released on the Super Nintendo, and when it was localized for North America, it was titled Secret of Mana. Many staples of that series were seen here first on the Game Boy, like Rabbites and Mush Boom enemies, multiple weapons with chargeable attacks, and of course, the Tree of Mana. Due to its connection to the popular Mana series, the game has been remade several times. Sword of Mana for the Game Boy Advance is an awesome game but feels very different, much more like Secret of Mana. Adventures of Mana for iOS is much more like the original, although sometimes the perspective feels awkward. Despite there being so many attempts to remake it, the original still holds up today and there are a ton of secret tricks you can perform on the Game Boy that you just can't do on the other versions. When Polygon released their list of the top 30 Game Boy games of all time, they ranked Final Fantasy Adventure at number 15. Modern players that attempt this game will still have to deal with all of the challenges retro games are notorious for. The dungeons are massive and feature numerous puzzles with vicious enemies. Don't forget to save your game, because the bosses can kill you in seconds.
But what if I told you about an easy trick that can give you absurdly powerful armor at the beginning of the game? What if I told you about a series of tricks that can warp you all the way to the final boss so you can beat the game in about an hour? And what if I told you the best way to defeat every boss? Even Julius himself? Well, on today's episode of You Can Beat Video Games, we'll learn all of that and more. If you're new to the channel, we're doing deep dives on retro video games and giving you the professional strategies that can be used by the casual gamer. Please make sure to subscribe and check out YouCanBeatVideoGames.com for episode lists, news, and official You Can Beat Video Games merchandise. Let's get started. All right, Final Fantasy Adventure. The game begins with the legend of the Tree of Mana. There are a lot of magical trees in video games. In something like Fazanadu, there's the World Tree with literal cities within its branches. The Tree of Mana is a bit smaller than that. It's more like the Holy Grail. But while the true tree gives eternal power, the false tree takes it away. Would you be surprised to find out that a guy named Dark Lord is trying to use the Tree of Mana to conquer the world? Yeah, that guy is a walking cliché. So at this point we get the chance to create our character, we have four letters to work with, and if you know this channel, the dog's name is Kylo Renly Baratheon, so our character will be named Kylo, and to stay on theme, we'll name the heroine of the story Rey. Once you're all set there, we jump right into the action in the Glaive Castle Gladiatorial Pits. Round 1. Fight! The game's first boss is this saber-toothed tiger, and the good news for us is that he walks in a W-shaped pattern and never comes down past the middle of the screen. So as long as we stay in the bottom and just keep slashing at him, we should have no problem defeating this guy. So it seems that we're part of some kind of military, yet we live in the castle dungeon and every day we have to fight monsters in a gladiatorial arena. It seems like questionable military strategy, but when you understand that people level up through experience points, well, Dark Lord actually has a pretty good idea here. Dark Lord may have even installed an invisible fence so that the monsters can't come down past the middle of the screen to make it easier for us to fight them and gain those experience points. But accidents do happen, and it seems that Kylo's friend Willy was mortally wounded. Willy, why? Why did you have to go to the top of the screen? I told you just stay at the bottom, you would have been totally okay! As Willy expires, he tells us that Mana is in danger, and says that we must seek the Gemma Knights. And with that, Willy passed away. I'll avenge you, Willy. I'll get Dark Lord for what he did to you. This will not stand. In this room we meet Amanda, who may not seem very important right now, but we will run into her again later. She wants to go home and see her little brother. We'll also talk to this other guy who tells us that the entrance that the monsters come in from leads to the outside, so there may be a way for us to escape. Before we head up there, we should probably save our game by pressing select and choosing the save function, and there's also a nice auto map that generates in this game. You can look at your status here, you can see that all of your stats start at 2. And when we head up the stairs, well, it's going to be time for us to fight another saber-toothed tiger. Just like the previous time, this boss won't come down to the bottom of the screen, so stay down there and slash at him. And he'll just keep looking like some kind of animal that the Flintstones would use as an appliance, who would say something like, 
and you think your job is tough. Once he's defeated, head out through the door that opens up, and you'll be able to climb down the side of the castle to relative safety. That gate closes, so there's nowhere to go over there, and if we head over here to the left, we see Dark Lord and another character named Julius hanging out near this mysterious waterfall. The two of them are acting very sketchy and discussing something about the mana tree which is at the top of the waterfall. Dark Lord wants to know how to get to the top of the falls and this is a guy that has access to a literal airship so I'm not sure why he's asking Julius this question and of course Julius gives him a dubious answer. Miracles occur sometimes Dark Lord. So instead of flying to the top of the falls, they decide to search for some kind of girl with magic powers. A much better plan. At this point, Julius realizes that we've been eavesdropping, and Dark Lord is not happy about it either. It's also at this point that we remember we were trying to escape from Dark Lord, so yeah, we better run. And, oh man, a dead end. Well, I guess it's a good thing we saved the game. Of course, there was nothing we could do to stop this from happening. Dark Lord pushes us off the ledge, and luckily he doesn't wait around to see if we actually died. Of course, since we fell from this kind of height and we don't seem to land in water, we land right on the hard ground. I have no idea how we survived either. Ouch. Yep, we fell all that distance and all we have to say is ouch. And I guess we're totally fine now. It's time to explore the base of the waterfall. There are only two different enemy types in this area, and they're both pretty easy to kill. The gremlins will give you a lot more money than the mushbooms do, so you probably want to focus on fighting them, because the first thing we're going to want to do here is build up to 140 gold pieces. If you find a treasure chest, pick up whatever items you find. A candy will restore up to 8 hit points whenever you use it. If we head over here to the right, we'll find the game's first town, the village of Topple, but we don't need to go in there just yet. The first thing we really want to do is rescue the heroine of the story, and she's right down here. Oh no! A mush boom! A single enemy! There could be more enemies on this screen, but however many enemies there are, just kill them off and then talk to the girl followed by Haseem. Poor Haseem. He wants us to take this girl to Wendell to see Bogard couldn't kill a single mushboom. Ugh. And yeah, that's the end of Haseem. There are a lot of deaths in this game but I wasn't particularly invested in this Haseem guy, so I'm not really all broken up about it. I was more invested in Willy, to be honest. Once Haseem finally kicks the bucket, the girl, Ray, will join us, and Ray is an awesome companion to have on our side. Most of the companions that will join our team will help us fight the enemies. Ray does not actively fight the enemies, but if we're fighting them and we take some damage, and then we pause the game and use the ask command, well then Ray will actually heal our wounds. It happens sort of slowly and it only lasts for a few moments, but you can do it as much as you want, so feel free to ask her as often as you need for healing. Now that we have Ray on our side for healing, we can just start farming enemies until we get that 140 gold that we need to buy the Iron Helmet. And while we're doing this, we'll also probably level up occasionally. Whenever you level up in this game, you're going to have the opportunity to choose how you grow your stats. So you can choose power, stamina, wisdom, or will. If we choose power, Power will go up by two points, but we'll also get a point of stamina and a point of will. You won't get any points of wisdom unless you put points into wisdom, so keep that in mind. If you want to build a character that focuses on magic, you're going to have to put a lot of your points into wisdom, whereas if you want to build a character that focuses on melee attacking, you're not going to be putting very many points into wisdom at all. The game seems to want you to build a melee-focused character, 
but it is possible to build a magic focused one if you really want to. That just presents a different set of problems and it's not something we're going to be doing in this video. Of the four stats that you can level up, Stamina is probably the most important one regardless of what kind of character you're trying to build. Stamina not only increases your hit points, but it also increases your defense. You add your stamina directly to your armor value. Whenever an enemy damages you, it's their damage minus that defense value, so stamina is very useful. Power, of course, affects how much damage you deal to enemies when you attack. Wisdom increases the damage that you deal with magic spells and raises your MP. And that last stat, Will, Will increases the speed that the Will meter at the bottom of the screen fills up. So here's how the Will meter works. Whatever percentage it's filled, so if it's 50% filled, you're going to add a 50% bonus to your attack. If it's completely filled, that's a 100% bonus, so it'll be double damage, and you'll also do a special attack with your weapon. Adding points to Will I don't think is extremely important. It's going to raise on its own whenever you increase other stats, so I don't recommend that you put any points directly into Will, but you will notice that it will start building up a lot faster as the game progresses. Now I said that Stamina was the most important stat, yet I've chosen Power for the first two levels, and that's because we're trying to build up this 140 gold pieces so that we can do a trick that's going to increase our defense so much that we won't need to put a lot of points into Stamina early in the game, and we can focus on building up our power so we can kill enemies a lot more quickly. So once you have enough money, head on into the Village of Topple. In here, if we head over to the right, we can run into a woman that says the exact same thing and looks exactly the same as the woman over on the left screen. Is she some kind of clone? This kid is really upset about Dark Lord and is willing to vent about it to anyone who will listen. And in here, this is what we were looking for. This is the weapon and armor store. So immediately buy that iron helmet and then go ahead and equip it. Once you've equipped the Iron Helm, you want to move the Bronze Helm over to the right, save the game, and then we're going to press A, B, select, and start all at the same time to do a soft reset. Now we're going to continue our game right from where we saved, and whenever we come in here and equip that Bronze Helmet that we moved, suddenly that helmet is going to give us plus 11 defense. Plus 11 is so much defense that we can just sell the old iron helmet. We won't need that anymore. It's so much defense that we're not going to find a helmet for quite some time that will give us more than plus 11. If you want to do the trick to warp to the end of the game, it is critical that you use this defense glitch because that's the last helmet that you're going to get before fighting the final boss. Over in this store, you can pick up some equipment. A pack of keys might not be a bad idea if you have some leftover money after selling back the iron helmet. And when we head over here, we can talk to an old man that tells us a bit about the Tree of Mana. He says it's watching us from above the clouds. Weird. There's not much else to see here in the village of Topple. If we head back to the first screen, we can go to this small house on the left Inside, there's a woman and her child. The woman tells us that she thinks the old man that lives by the waterfalls is a total weirdo. But he also was a gallant knight, so maybe he's that Bogard guy we've been looking for. This kid informs us that the Dark Lord is looking for a girl that knows the secret of the Tree of Mana. And, um, yeah, we don't know anything about that. Okay, bye. If we head over to the inn, well, we can stay at the inn for 10 gold pieces a night, but if we ask Ray, she'll just heal us for nothing. My grandmother always used to say, why go to the inn when you can get your heals for free? With the village of Topple firmly in our rearview mirror, it's time to seek out Bogard. If we look at our map, well, the only thing marked on our map are a few villages, so I guess that's better than nothing, but it's not going to help us find Bogard. Instead, we're going to follow the river to the right. 
Once we can't go right anymore, you're gonna go down and then head right again. And then we're going to follow the path up and back to the left. That's going to take us to the other side of the river. Take out any enemies that get in your way. We've been only fighting gremlins and mushbooms for quite some time now, but in a few screens we're gonna finally see something new. That's right. Up here we finally run into the classic Rabbite enemy, and this would be the very first appearance of a Rabbite in any game. The imp enemies are a little bit more dangerous than the Rabbites, but none of the enemies in this area can deal very much damage to us at all because we have that super helmet on. So now is a great time to build up some levels, and if you do take any damage, just make sure to ask Ray to heal your wounds. When you get up here, we can go left or right. If we go to the right, that's going to take us to a cave that we can't really get through right now, so for now, let's head over to the left. On this screen, we want to head up and loop our way around to the left. Once we get down to the bottom, we're going to be able to follow the river again, and that's going to lead us to the waterfall, where we'll find Bogard's house. So we'll take out another enemy or two, and then head over to the left, climb up this vine, and inside this small house, we'll find an old man. Is this Bogard? So I don't know if we look like the cops or something, but whenever we talk to this guy, he totally denies being Bogard. Bogard's not here, man. Well, until you talk to him three times, and then suddenly he notices the pendant of mana. Oh, now things are different. After some serious prodding, Bogard finally tells us all about the Gemma Knights and about the war that he fought in against an evil empire called Vandal. It seems that Vandal was using the power of mana to try to conquer the world, as evil empires do. The Geminites were losing the war, but then a mysterious lady showed up, and she was able to turn the tide for them. That lady had the same pendant that Rey has, and well, it seems that it was Ray's mother. Seeing the pendant brings Bogard to our side, and he tells us that we should take the Matic item, which we'll find in the next room. Now, the Matic is an item that we can only use seven times, and we're going to be able to use it to break through certain types of rocks, pots, and also walls. Now, if you want to check a wall to see if you can break it with a Matic, you can hit it with a regular weapon first. It'll make a weird noise if you can matic through the wall. That way you won't waste your matic trying to use it on all the walls. It's kind of like the bombs in Zelda. Just like the bombs in Zelda, once we get into the next area, we're going to find enemies that will drop matics, and we'll also find stores that sell them. But for now, take the seven that you found at Bogard's house, and we're going to work our way back to where we had to choose for going left and right before, and we're going to go to that cave that we weren't going to be able to pass previously, but now we have the Matic and we're going to be able to get through there. So just head through these enemies, climb down the vines, work your way over to the right here, and here's where we could have gone right before, so we are going to go right this time. Come up here, take out those Rabbites, Get out of my way, him. And there is the cave. So make your way down that vine, and oh, we leveled up again first, so that's good. And we're going to take power again. We have so much defense because of that helm glitch that we don't really need the stamina just yet. This imp had a candy for us. The candy is the weakest of the game's recovery items, so later on in the game we're going to want to throw those away. But for now, we'll pick them up. Now here's where we need to use that Matic. So equip it, and press the B button. You want to be standing right between those two rocks so that you hit both of them with one Matic swing. Once you're through, take out the enemies on the other side and just make your way to the bottom. That'll bring you to the exit. You can also use Matic to break these pots. There's nothing hidden in these ones, but there could be some areas where you'll need to break pots to be able to move forward. And that brings us to the marsh. Before we actually get into the marsh itself, we're going to come across a store, and that store sells a very important new weapon, the battle axe, 
and we're going to need 150 gold pieces to be able to buy it, so make sure that you have enough money before you get there. If you need to fight a few enemies, fight a few enemies. It shouldn't take too much to be able to build up the money you need, especially if you sold that iron helmet we bought at the beginning of the game. So we definitely have enough now, and there's the store that we were looking for, so pop on in, and as soon as you talk to the vendor here, he'll immediately try to sell you the battle axe. And yeah, we do want to buy it, although it is a little bit suspicious that he seems to be wanting to get rid of it so badly. After purchasing the battle axe, or even if you didn't, you can buy some items in here. If you need some more Maddox, you can purchase them now, but we should have enough for the moment. It's swampy ahead, so be careful, and we can try equipping that battle axe. You'll see that it deals a decent amount more damage than our broadsword did. Head over to the right once you have that axe. These trap flowers can poison you, and getting poisoned is not that bad at this point in the game. You can just ask Ray to heal you, and that will counteract the poison. And there are a few other strategies you can use for dealing with poison, so... If we get poisoned, we can discuss some of those things we can try. The first thing that we need to do here in the marsh is make our way to Ket's house. Until we go to Ket's house, we will not be able to find the bronze key that will open up the marsh cave, so we have to go here first. Be aware that we will lose Ray whenever we do this though, so if you want to build up some levels while you still have her to ask, you should do that before coming to Ket's house and using the bed on the left side. When we talk to this guy, he seems like a very suspicious character. He tells us that there's three rooms over on the west side, so that seems almost too good to be true, and also that we can never go past that door. That's Mr. Lee's room, and we do not go in there. If we come up here to this bed, we see a short cutscene, and during this cutscene, Ray tells us that she thinks it would be good if we learned the magic of cure. Yeah, I totally agree, Ray. Why didn't you teach us this sooner? This is our very first magic spell, and it's the one that we're going to be using the most. It will restore our health. So yeah, we're certainly going to use cure magic quite a bit, and there is no better cure magic. As you raise your wisdom, you'll get more powerful cures, but we will never get like a cure 2 or a full cure, nothing like that. And during the night, it's time to call Olivia Benson, because this just turned into an episode of SVU. We should have known that a free in was too good to be true, and it seems that this Mr. Lee guy is probably some kind of serial killer, or worse. Whenever we talk to this guy that stands in front of the door, he says the exact same thing he said yesterday, and then he adds in this bit about your friend, I do not know her. Well, I didn't ask you if you knew her. I want to know where she is. It's a different question. Well, in any case, we can't just kill that guy. Instead, we're going to need to find a magic mirror and show him his true reflection because video game logic. So we're going to head over here to the right. To be able to get that magic mirror, we need to get into a place called the Marsh Cave. But to get into that cave requires a special key, and we'll find that key on this screen right here, which is known as the Lizard Nest. You need to kill all six of these Lizard Man enemies, and then they will spawn a chest where you'll find the Bronze Key. The Lizard Man enemies are very good for experience points, and there's a lot of them on this screen, and they'll keep respawning. So if you want to keep fighting them, you can. Unfortunately, the Lizard Man enemies will not appear until you drop the girl off at Ket's, so you can't build up your levels here when you still have her to ask for healing. But if you want to, feel free to grind a little bit there, but once you have that bronze key, we're going to make our way up here, and, oh, that Marma Blue poisoned me. If you're poisoned, you can just keep going between the same screen, Wait until the poison music wears off, and you'll see we barely took any damage at all. So that's another way you can deal with poison. Once you get to this door, this is where we need the bronze key. So we equip it, and then just go right into the door. And that takes us into the marsh cave. And it's our friend, the red mage from Final Fantasy. Still pimping, I see. 
Red Maid seems to have lost some of his girls over at that cat's house as well, and he also knows some more information. It seems that that Mr. Lee is keeping them in caskets in the basement. That is very uncool. He'll offer to join us, and once he does, we're going to head up into this room. You can also go down at the beginning, but we need to head this way first so that we can get a new weapon, the sickle. When you get into this room, be very careful not to touch these enemies. Almost everything in here can poison you, and getting poisoned is pretty annoying, although we do know how to deal with it now. You need to touch the switch in that room, which will open a stairway. And as we come through here, let's use our cure magic real quick and then head over to this room, where all we really need to do is climb down this vine and make our way back to the left. Try to kill a few of these enemies first, grab some experience points, and then just head back this way and go into the cave. It's in here that we're going to find that sickle, so make your way to the right once you get inside, and in the next room, you're going to see a set of rocks conspicuously located down near the bottom wall. When you hit the wall, it makes a noise, so this is one of those walls that you can use a mattock on to destroy. Equip one of your mattocks. We've actually picked up several since we got in here. And when you slide over that patch of ice, you'll be able to grab this treasure chest and find the sickle, but you can't go back over the ice. We'll have to equip that sickle, and we'll be able to use it to clear the plants in this area. And that's something that the sickle can do in addition to being just a better weapon than the ones we had before. Once we have the sickle, we're going to make our way back to the beginning of the dungeon. And we could have gone down at the beginning of the dungeon, but instead we went up so that we could find the sickle. Well, now we have to go the other way. So make your way through these enemies, kill whichever ones get into your path, and we've leveled up another time. Nice. We'll just choose power again. We're still building up our attack, and we're becoming very effective in battle. Back in this room, we're gonna head over to the right, and then back down, and that will take us to the beginning. So this was the first room in the dungeon, and now, in this room, these enemies we're going to have to kill with magic, but we don't have any offensive magic right now, so we're going to have to rely on the red mage to be able to kill them. We'll see if he can do it. Eh, not gonna wait around for these guys. In this room, we can come over here. The skeleton is a good enemy to kill because a skeleton can potentially drop keys, and there's a locked door right here, so if you don't have any keys, you can keep fighting the skeleton until you get some, but you don't have to go in here. This is just going to take us to a recovery spring, and to get to that recovery spring, you want to push this treasure chest onto the switch, and then go over to the stairs. And here's that spring. To activate it, just go down to the bottom and press up against it. You only really need to do it one time, and now's a very good time to save your game. You should probably be saving your game frequently, but I don't want to do it too often because it disrupts the flow of the video. But keep that in mind, something that you don't want to do is save your game in a bad spot. Remember that whenever you come back into the game after you reload it, even if you cleared all the enemies in a room, those enemies will have respawned, so never save your game when you're at very low health, or in a room that's very dangerous. Up here you can see there's some plants to cut, but first we're going to head over here to the right. If we can kill all of the urchin enemies in this room, we're going to get the iron shield. And there it is. Shields are weird in this game. Armor and helmets just add some stats to your defense, but shields don't add any stats to your defense. Instead, shields help you block certain types of projectiles, and they also help you push enemies around. If you don't upgrade your shield, eventually you're going to be facing enemies that have projectiles that you can't block, or that you won't be able to push around. So it is important, and this iron shield is going to help us against the boss who shoots fireballs. Make your way to this room, and we're going to need to use a mattock on this conspicuous looking rock in the upper right corner. Underneath that rock, we're going to find a stairway. We're almost to the end of this cave, so just make your way to the bottom of these vines. Once you get down to the next screen, we're going to head over to the left. 
and we've leveled up again. We'll just take another level of power, keep it simple, and our stats are building up pretty fast. It's pretty easy to level up in this game, you don't usually have to grind at all. Head over to this cave on the left, and once we head inside, we just have to go through a few more rooms. We'll head through this door, and we're just going to go down into the next room. We're building up a nice supply of Maddox from the enemies that drop them in this area, and the skeletons will give us some keys, so if you see skeletons, make sure you fight them too. Maddox and keys are going to be the things that we need the most to get through the dungeons. Later on, we'll find a weapon that will replace Maddox, but until we get to there, we will definitely need them. In this room, we have another puzzle, and this puzzle requires some Maddox. We're going to go to the switch at the top here. We unfortunately can't kill that enemy, so we need to have the red mage kill it if we're lucky, or just kind of deal with it. Use your Maddox to get through that rock, and then use a Maddox on the rock at the bottom and touch the other switch. That will bring us to the boss. Now's a good time to equip our cure magic, and you should probably save the game just in case you die in here. And here he is, the Hydra. You can see that our iron shield can block the fireballs that the Hydra throws, but remember that if you're casting cure magic or attacking, you won't be blocking. The best way to fight this guy is to go up here to the top of the screen and just attack the Hydra from above. Most of the time he doesn't go all the way to the top of the screen and you'll be safe up here, but if he does go all the way to the top, you just need to step over to the left for a moment and you'll be able to block some fireballs and attack the Hydra some more. And that's it. We've defeated the Hydra and we'll gain the Magic Book of Fire and of course the thing we were actually looking for, the Magic Mirror. The man tells us to show it to the guy at Ket's. He'll scream and show his true colors. Well, of course he will. That's what always happens in games when you show people a magic mirror. Now that we have the magic mirror, let's hustle back to Ketz. Head down one screen and then just keep on heading to the left until we get there. We do have the fire magic now, so we could kill some of those mudman enemies that we haven't been able to damage before. But let's not worry about that too much right now. Let's hurry back and try to rescue our friend. Do your best not to get poisoned, although if you do, you know how to deal with it. Just keep transitioning between two screens until the poison wears off. Now that we're back at Cats, it occurs to me that we never visited this room up here. It'd be pretty embarrassing if Ray was hiding up here, but she's not. It's just two people that give us some clues. This boy tells us that we need that magic mirror, and this woman, who looks like a white mage, she tells us about the lizard man's nest. And that's how we would have found out about the bronze key. So yeah, those clues would have been helpful yesterday. But in any case, before we go deeper into the dungeon, let's head back to the bedroom and get a nice free heal. It seems like Mr. Lee isn't interested in men, so it's safe for us. Now, whenever we come back this way, we're going to equip that mirror and talk to this guy. At first, it doesn't seem like it's working. This guy just says the same old thing that he always says. Please feel free to use the western room. You can't get past this door. It's for Mr. Lee. But then, that mirror. And yeah, it was a good thing that we stayed over in that western room, because this guy was actually a werewolf. Once he turns all wolf on you, quickly take him out with your sickle, and then we can head into the Ket's House dungeon. Inside we'll meet some new enemy types and also some old ones. The skeletons and the slimes are back, but now we have the fire magic that we can use to take out the slimes. Make sure to kill the skeletons though, the keys that they drop are very useful, although they are pretty cheap to buy at the store. Whenever we use some fire, we'll be able to get some Maddox from those enemies, so if you do run out of Maddox, you would want to use fire on those slimes until they drop some for you. Now we'll head back over into this room where we're going to take the stairs, and those stairs are going to take us into the next area, where we're going to head down through this door. 
Would you believe that that wall on the right side is one that we can break through? How would we have ever figured that out? It's not like they put a bunch of blocks in front of it or something. Use whichever Matic as the lowest. We do have a limited amount of item space. And then we'll come into this room. When we've leveled up again. Nice. Just getting levels all over the place. We can take Wisdom this time, maybe? We are going to start using a little bit of magic, and if we don't ever raise Wisdom, we're never going to have more MP. So, now might be a good time to take a quick level of Wisdom, otherwise just take Power again. And in this room, these zombies are another one of those enemy types that we can't just kill with our Sickle, we would need to use Fire, or you can just try to push them around with your shield and make your way down here. If that Nemesis Owl gets you, he could inflict you with the Dark Status effect, but the Dark Status isn't that big of a deal. It wears off pretty fast and you can still see the enemies. In this room, there's a bunch of jars surrounding a switch. Well, we need to use a Matic to clear out some of those jars, and when you step on the switch, a hidden stairway will appear. We may need to use some fire to get rid of these slimes. Get out of here, slime and then head down the stairs that we just created. Make your way around those spikes, you don't want to take any damage from them. And in this area, we're going to be able to accomplish our first goal in this dungeon, and that is to find the Chain Flail. The Chain Flail is another new weapon, and this one works a lot like the Hookshot in Zelda, so we're also going to need it to get through this dungeon. Either way, we're going to be very happy to have it as a weapon, the Chain Flail is something that we're going to be using against a lot of bosses. Once you have it, you'll need to whip that post over to the right, and you'll be able to go right through the blocks. So see, it works a lot like the Hookshot, although it's a little bit different. Unlike the Hookshot, it can actually penetrate the blocks in this game. The Chain also has excellent range, which is just great for fighting enemies. You'll be able to hit them from far away. Make your way back the way you came once you have the chain flail. Walk around the spikes again and go back into the stairs. We're going to be able to use the hookshot ability in this room over here to get across to the left. So we needed the chain flail for this, and once we head over into this area, we're going to be able to finally rescue the girl. Hang tight, Ray. We're coming. You could go around to the left, but there's a shortcut right here if we use a mattock on the wall at the top. This one's not as well marked as some of the other walls that we can mattock through. Up here, if we use another mattock, we can get through those jars, and that's another shortcut. Pretty good. We only had to use two mattocks, and we were able to skip about five rooms. Push the treasure chest onto that switch, and head up into this stairway and we'll want to use a mattock on the jar in the lower right. That stairway will bring us to this room and we're going to head over to the right and we're going to need to use a key here and that will take us to the room where the girl is. We just found an item called a pillow. A pillow is a single use magic that can put enemies to sleep. So that's what that does. Not a great item, especially since we're about to learn the actual sleep magic come down here and talk to this casket and inside we'll find Ray. And Ray can now do her ask ability again for healing, which is awesome. Once you have Ray with you, we just need to get back to the dungeon's entrance and that's where we're going to have to fight the boss. The fastest way to get there of course is to matic through some of these jars, but since we've gone that way before I'll show you the slightly longer path. If you come through here, there's a few of those mice and the zombies. So just try to get past them, head down through this door, loop around, and that will bring you back to the room where those jars are. We may need to use some fire to get through here, so it probably is worth it to just use the mattock again. But if you wanted to see the other path, that's what it looks like. And this path is still open, so we can just go right back through it. Once you get into here, go back into the stairs, and that's going to take us back outside where we'll need to use our chain flail again to get back over to the right. 
The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past had to have been in development whenever this game came out, and I wonder if anybody from that development team saw this and was like, whoa, that is really similar to the hook shot that we were designing. Once you get into here, we're just going to head through this door over to the right, and then work our way back to the beginning. It's not very far from here. In the next room, if we want to try out that pillow item, we can give that a go, although I don't think it works on all of these enemy types. That's one thing about sleep magic, it only works on certain ones, and I'm surprised that it actually works on the owls, but it doesn't seem to do much against the pumpkin bombs. And once again, we have gained a level, bringing us to level 9, and we'll take power again. We are getting quite powerful. You can just try to push these zombies out of the way, or you can use fire on them, and then just make your way to the left, and then down, and then we're going to go to the left again. And this is going to be a cure, so that's nice. That's much better than candy. Now, if you remember, when we came through here before, we came from the top, so we need to head back up here and go through the stairs. And that's going to take us very close to the beginning, so we'll go through this door, loop back down to the bottom, try not to get killed by these enemies. One thing about those zombies is that they can drop the ether item, and ether will restore our magic points, so it might be a good idea to kill a few of those guys, especially if you plan on using magic. And this is it, this is the last room before the boss, so make sure that you have full health before you go in there, and you may even want to have a full will meter. We can try out our fire magic, fire magic works against this boss, and if you have a full will meter whenever you attack with the fire magic, it will still affect the magic, so it actually gives you four times as much damage whenever you have a fully powered will bar. Hey, if we're going to use some magic, we might as well make it count. And whenever we enter this room, Lee says, that's my victim, and it turns out he was a vampire all along. You can use your fire magic if you want to, but I recommend just using the chain flail and ask as soon as you take any damage so that you can start restoring health. The boss only goes into four different positions, and he'll just kind of float between those four spots. And whenever he stops in one of them, he'll open up his cape and he'll launch some bats, and that'll give you an opportunity to hit him. You want to aim for the body, not his arms. And if you're aiming for the body, you should also hit the bats that he attacks with, and that should keep you safe from those as well. Once he's defeated, you'll learn the sleep magic, and we'll finally be able to leave cats with Ray. Now that Ray is no longer part of Mr. Lee's vampire harem, we can make our way to Wendell to the south. To get there, we're going to need to use our chain flail, and we want to head back to that room where the lizard man nest is. So head over here to the right. If you want to use your fire magic to take out those mud man enemies, you can do that if you'd like. Whenever you kill them, sometimes they'll drop ethers, and we know that ethers are a pretty good item. From here, we're just going to head down to the south. And here's that lizard man nest. The lizard man enemy is very easy to kill now that we have the chain flail. And we're just going to head over to the left. They drop cure items, so if they drop any of those, those aren't the worst. They're a lot better than candy at least, but you don't want that bronze key that appears in the middle. We'll equip our sickle, and that'll help us get through these plants. So we can use our fire to take out some mud men and head down here, and then we're going to go over to the left, and up one screen, and that will take us to this spot where we need to use the chain flail. Once you have your chain flail equipped, watch me whip, no nay nay, and just get over to the left side, bust through these enemies, and head on down. From here it's just a short walk to Wendell. And this is a turning point in the game. From here, we can warp all the way to the final boss, or we can just proceed through the game as normal. But before we do any of that, I highly recommend that we buy the next armor in the town of Wendell. That will help us a little bit whenever we're facing the very difficult final boss. 
so we can take out these Buzzbees and then just make our way to the right. Sometimes these guys will drop a gold item and that's an item that we can sell for a lot of money but it doesn't have a lot of uses besides that. Other times they'll drop candy so that can happen too. I hope that that treasure chest is the gold and not the candy, but we're about to find out. And it was gold, all right, nice. So we'll head up here to town. This is Wendell. Wendell looks a lot like the towns from the original Final Fantasy, except for the store vendors, which are very much a mana series staple. In here, we could stay at the inn, but of course we have the free inn that walks around with us, so we don't need to do that. And this kid tells us that the dwarf cave is to the west, and he is very excited to tell us that. This guy sells some basic items, and we can sell some back to him if you have a few things that you don't need. We do have a limited amount of space for items, so you definitely want to get rid of things like gold and any other superfluous items whenever you come to a store. The store that we're actually looking for is up here on this screen, but we'll visit this house on the left first. This kid who seems to be home alone tells us about a guy named Siba who lives in this town. Yeah, that's somebody we were looking for. And here is that weapon store. We're going to buy the iron armor. We already have the iron shield, and we definitely don't need another broadsword, that's for sure. So make sure to equip your iron armor, and then we can exit the store. Unless you want to sell back the bronze armor, but it's not super important that we do that right now. Before we go and do the trick that takes us to the final boss, let's talk to the last few people in the town. This woman tries to dazzle us with her knowledge of the science of how waterfalls work. Yeah, thanks a lot for woman explaining that to us. <sighs> and then we're going to head over here to the right. If you head up the middle, that's where we're going to meet Siba, and that's going to advance the story. So if you want to warp to the final boss, you don't want to do that. This guy just wants to tell us that he heard the tree of mana was beautiful. Cool, dude. And down here, hey, it's our friend, Red Mage! What's up, man? I hear that pimping ain't easy. And then we can head over here, where we're back at the beginning. At this point, I'm going to save on a second file, so that we can come back to this part later. But for now, let's make our way to the end of the game. To be able to warp to the final boss, we need to perform three different tricks. None of them are that difficult to do, but to be able to do the third one, you must have Rey with you, so make sure that she's with you before you attempt any of this, or you could get stuck. You've been warned. Alright, you still in? Great. To do the first trick, we need to head back to the area near Ket's house. Whose house? Ket's house. Over here, we'll need to use our sickle, and we're going to need to use the sickle to do the trick anyway, so we might as well equip it now. Equip that sickle, cut through the plants, and make your way to the right. This is the lizard nest. Make sure to pick up any of these cures that you find. Unless you have better items, these could come in handy whenever you fight the final boss. Up here, we just want to head to the left, and then we're going to go left just one more screen. This is the spot. So check out the map here and you can see where we are. From here, we're going to use our sickle on these plants and then we're going to walk over to the right, face up, sickle and move to the left at the same time. And you'll see that we've warped to the snow fields. Pretty cool, right? Or at least cold. In any case, this is a very high level area, so you might want to save Although, be aware that you will not be able to go back from here, so you might want to save on another file. In this area, the next thing that we need to do is find a blizzard item, and it's these walrus enemies that drop them. You can use that sleep magic that we just got to freeze them in place, and then attack them at range with your chain flail. Remember, 
If anything touches you here, you are going to die. Normally in this area, you would be in levels at the high 20s, maybe low 30s. And right now at about level 10, yeah, anything can easily take us out. We can also level up very fast over here. This brings us to level 11, and we should probably pick stamina right now so that we can keep our health a little bit higher. But it's not going to matter at this point. Everything is still going to one-shot us, and there's going to be a better place for us to level up a bit later. Once you find the blizzard item, and we haven't found it yet, you need to keep fighting these walruses until you get it. You must have the blizzard item to do the third trick. So keep fighting these. Oh, there it is. Okay. And we can't carry. We're going to need to get rid of an item, but it is good to have a full inventory for another trick that we're going to do later. So we'll just use that item, and we'll get that blizzard. And then we're going to enter the ice cave, which is through that door up there. We want to be very careful around that snowman. He can definitely mess us up. Oh man, snowman. And of course, don't touch any of these enemies either. You might want to save as soon as you get in here. The next trick is called the sword warp. And to do it, we need to be in this room, but we want to keep resetting this room until we get a good set of enemies so that they're not in the way. We also need to equip our broadsword. We need to keep resetting this next room until all the enemies are out of the way and in the bottom of the screen, and we also need a full will meter. Once that happens, we want to walk onto the edge of the ice on the left side, this might work. Go down to this corner, take a step to the left, and when you see yourself slip, that's when you want to attack. And right before you go through the wall, make sure you take a step down, or you may end up stuck in the wall. Once you get through, you want to keep doing this pattern where you go right, up, right, up, right, up, and that will get you to the room that you're looking for, this one with all the pots in it. And then we're going to take this stairway. This is where we're going to do the third trick. This is an area called the Cave of Float Rocks, so we've warped to a totally different zone. We're going to need to use the blizzard, and we need to save the game. There's no enemies right now, but whenever we reload the game, you'll notice that there will be enemies. Very convenient. This is an even higher level area than the previous one, so be very careful in here. You need to transform an enemy into a snowman with that blizzard, then get down on top of it at the bottom of the screen, wait for the girl to push you until you're overlapping it, and then attack it with your sword as you transition downward. That will warp you here to the Temple of Mana. And if you head up into this room and talk to this woman, she will give you the Excalibur Sword, the best weapon in the game. That's a pretty big upgrade from what we had before. You'll probably want to save the game at this point. You could go up from this room, that would take you to the final boss, but you'll probably get smoked at this level. Instead, we want to take our new Excalibur and grind some levels against these elephants. Now the elephants are very dangerous, but with our sleep magic, we can stop them from moving. Don't touch the elephants still. Just attack them at range with your Excalibur, and you will level up very fast. We're going to need both power and stamina to be strong enough to beat the game. I recommend having at least 40 stamina and over 45 power as well. I was able to beat the game at level 30, but I recommend some higher levels than that. I would recommend going all the way to 40 if you have the time. It shouldn't take that long to do it. Now, there's another reason why we should be fighting these elephants. Remember when I said before that we need to have a full inventory to do a trick? Of course, as you're fighting these elephants, occasionally they'll drop treasure boxes with an item inside. Now, the elephant could drop two different items. One of them is an item called a unicorn, and that just heals status ailments. But the other thing is a very important piece of equipment called the Aegis Shield. Now, if your inventory is completely full, you can just keep trying to collect this chest until you finally get the Aegis Shield. That's because every time you try to open it, it re-rolls what's inside, and if you can't hold the item, eventually you'll have to get the shield. 
pretty sweet. The Aegis Shield is very useful against the final boss. It's pretty important that you get it. Once you get to at least level 30, you can attempt the final battle. You'll probably want to save your game before you head to the final battle. And there are three forms of the final boss, and you can actually save your game after the first two. But just be aware, if you save your game during the final boss battle, you will not be able to go back and level up more. So make sure that you're very confident before you lock it in. Of the three forms of the final boss, I think the second one is the most difficult. And whenever the boss attacks with large round fireballs, those are nukes, and you can block those if you have the Aegis Shield. Just make sure you're not trying to cast Cure whenever you need to be blocking. If you need to cure, try to get far away from the boss and then cast Cure several times. You may need to use an Aether, and don't be afraid to ask Ray for healing. I have a much more detailed final boss strategy for later in the guide, and I don't really want to spoil the entire final boss fight right now. So, as long as your levels are high enough, over level 30 should be enough, then you can beat the game with this weak set of equipment, and you can do it very fast. Now those tricks are pretty exciting, but there is a lot more to this game to be played. So let's go back to our other save file and see what happens when we meet up with Siba in the town of Wendell. It seems like we've been searching the entire game for this Siba guy, and he's located right here inside this enormous building. Now he's some kind of sage, and he has some sage advice for us. But first, he tells us that Bogard told him about us. How did Bogard get here ahead of us? Is he here now? Or did he send like a carrier pigeon or something? I don't know. Well, in any case, Ray will step forward here and have a vision of her mother. Maybe it's less of a vision and more like a seance. The screen fades to black, and when it comes back, Ray's mother is with us. Hey, what's up, Ray's mom? We all seem kind of surprised to see her, and I guess maybe we should be. It's not every day that, like, magic spirits appear. And Siba can confirm that she's the one that helped the Geminites defeat the Vandal Empire, but the way he describes it, he says that She's the one that encouraged us? It kind of sounds like all you needed to win the war was some kind of cheerleader. Like you were able to turn the tide of battle with the power of positive reinforcement. At this point, she explains the rest of the plot. The reason why Julius and the Dark Lord can't just fly to the top of the waterfalls is because she sealed them with the power of the Pendant. And only the girl and the pendant will be able to open the way to the Tree of Mana. Glaive is the new Vandal. Once again, people are trying to use the power of the Mana Tree to conquer the world. We have to stop them. In times past, those that have defended the Tree of Mana were known as the Gemma Knights. And that is what we must be. As Ray's mother fades back into the ethereal plane, it's a somber moment, but we don't have time to appreciate it. It seems that the Glaive Empire is attacking right now, but luckily, our friend the Red Mage comes in to lend a hand and take Ray to a safe place. Of course, as soon as he's gone, we realize that he never said where he was taking her. Hmm, this might be suspicious. As we head outside, we see a man who was attacked from behind. Attacked by who? Who did this? Oh, was it the imps and the rabbites? Well, we're very powerful against these enemies now, so just make your way to the bottom, and when we exit the town of Wendell... Well, that's not Ray, that's the Red Mage. No, no, it's not the Red Mage. It's Julius. It was Julius all along. Well, I guess that Julius has gotten us back for eavesdropping on him at the beginning of the game, and it does not feel good being on the receiving side of that. Now that he has Ray and he knows for sure that she's the girl that he was looking for, 
the Glaive Empire will be able to seize control of the Tree of Mana. This is not good. Before he leaves, he does a quick demonstration to let us know that we have no chance against him, but we know that already. I recommend being at at least level 30. He then makes a pretty strange taunt, calling us... My dear. Yeah, that's pretty weird, Julius, even for you, dude. Well, the screen fades out, but we are definitely not dead. Well, it seems that our friend Seba was able to save us. And it seems like we're alright, so that's good news. By some kind of magical power, he knows exactly where Julius took her. To the west in his airship. So that's where we need to go next. He also gives us the magic book of heal, so now we know the heal magic. Healing magic is alright, we'll be able to use it to get rid of poison, stone, or darkness, and the most important one that we're going to use it on is stone, because if you're stuck in one place, and that's what stone does, you can become very vulnerable to the enemies. Something that's very important to know about the heal spell, whenever you cast it, it will make you have zero defense until you pause the game. So that's a weird glitch, and that's something that you should definitely work around. So if you ever cast heal, just make sure to hit start real quick and bring up that menu, and you'll be totally fine. Over here, we're going to need to use our battle axe to chop down some trees. So we haven't really done this yet, but we did buy the axe for a reason. It wasn't just because it was a good weapon. So we'll cut through those trees and make our way up here. Try to watch out for the buzz bees. I was not very fortunate. From here, we can just head down and make our way to the little item shop at the bottom of the map. Most of the item shops in this game just sell things like keys or maddox, maybe some potions. But this one has a very important item. It's oil, and we're going to need it in the next dungeon. The next thing that we need to do is get some silver out of the silver mine so that we'll be able to enter the mouth of Gaia. Until you have equipment made out of silver, we will not be able to go through the mouth of Gaia, and we won't be able to proceed to the next area. So here at the store, make sure you buy that oil and pick up any other supplies that you need. We need the oil so that we can use the mine car in the silver mine. So we're going to get to the silver mine, and as soon as we get in there, there's going to be a mine car that we need to use, and without the oil, we will not be able to go any farther. So that's why we had to get that. And now we're going to equip our battle axe so that we can cut through some trees, and that's going to make the path that we need to get to the silver mine. So head up here past the pig warriors, which look suspiciously like moblins. And in this one, you need to head to the right first, up to this little clearing, and then we can head back over to the left. Looks like we leveled up again. We'll grab some power. And just keep working your way over here to the left. You'll see that some of the trees leave behind stumps, but not all of them do. Up here, you can find a small inn. So if you need to replenish your health, this could be a good place to do it. It only costs 10 gold, and 10 gold is, well, it's not very much money at all. So we'll stop in here and make sure that we have full health before we go into the next dungeon. And the silver mine is going to be right over to the left, so we're very close to where we need to go. Head up here, and then we'll just cut down through this path, and that's it. That's the silver mine. As promised, there's that mine car that needs to be oiled, so we're going to equip our oil item, and we may also want to equip the sickle. Once we get going here, this is going to be a bit of a wild ride, and the sickle is going to be a very good weapon for hitting the switches that we need to hit. Now we need to skip the first switch, so don't hit that one. But after we go a few rooms here, there's going to be another switch, so it's after this room right here. Hit that switch, and then there's another one in the next room. And if you hit those two switches, that will put you on a path that leads to this gaping hole. 
If you do it wrong, you'll keep getting looped around and you'll have to fight the enemies over and over again. So remember, you just want to hit the second and third switch. And that brings us down here, where we'll find a new party member. This is the third different party member that we've had. This guy's name is Watts. Watts is a character that shows up in many of the other Mana series games. And he is a pretty awesome companion. If you ask him, instead of healing you, he will just automatically take you to a store and you can sell him all of your junk and you can also buy some things that you might need. So yeah, having Watts around is really nice. Wow, we're sure carrying around a lot of junk. Sell off any stuff you don't need and then pick up some Maddox if you don't have any. We are going to need them here in the silver mine. It's not a very long path that we have to go here, so make your way up into this room where we're going to have to use a mattock right away. We have to get through that stone in the upper part. So we'll equip one of those, put on the lowest amount mattocks that you have first so that we can get rid of them, take out this mimic chest, and we'll head over here to the right. Once again, we're going to have to use our mattock to clear some stones here, but if we break some rocks and head down to the bottom, there's a nice recovery spring we can use. Of course, if we need more Maddox, we can always just buy them from Watts, so we might as well take advantage of this recovery spring. And when we come up here, we're going to need to break through some more rocks, and then you may not be surprised to find out that we can bust through the wall on the right. So we'll use some more Maddox, bust through the wall, and in here, well, we have a little bit of a puzzle. We're going to need to use our mattock on this jar right here. That'll clear it out of the way. And that's really all there is to the puzzle. Once you hit that switch, it'll open up the stairs and we'll be able to head down to letter B. We're going to cross over a rickety bridge. Watch out for the spiders in this area. Hit them with your chain flail. That's probably your best bet and then make your way to this door which will take us back into the caves. From here it's very simple. We're just going to head to the left one room and then we're going to go up another room and there's going to be a stairway in that room that'll take us on. So head on up into here. No puzzle this time. Just watch out for the spiders and make your way to the stairs. Whenever we go up the stairs it's going to bring us into another room We'll just go through the door on the left. And in here, there's another stairway leading downwards. This one's going to take us outside, and it's going to take us into the area where the boss is. You may want to save the game here because it is a boss. You can equip your fire magic if you want. You don't really need it. This boss is the Megapede, and if you know what to do, this boss is super easy. You can just hang out right here on this vine and the Megapede will not be able to damage you here. From here, you should be able to hit it with the Chain Flail. If it's too far away, you can try hitting it with your Fire Magic. It's not super necessary. And it's kind of slow to fight the boss this way, but it is totally and completely safe. As long as you don't move out of this position, you will not take any damage from this boss at all. This is good news if you got to the boss and you either had very low health or you are extremely underleveled. Either way, you're going to be able to beat this boss because you won't get hurt by it. So just be patient. If you try to fight the Megapede, if you just go out there and start attacking it, you'll be surprised how easy it is to run into this boss and you'll take a lot of damage if you do that. If you do get impatient and you just want to fight the Megapede, I highly recommend that you equip your Cure Magic before you do that. For the most part, your best bet is to just stay up here, keep attacking whenever the Megapede gets close. You can only damage it in the head, so don't try to attack the body. Just let your will bar fill up whenever you're not nearby. And if you think you're close, you can kind of leave the position and go out there and finish it off. I don't think we're going to die from this point. Yep, that's it. We've defeated the Megapede. Oh, and we leveled up too, nice. 
We're doing pretty good on power, now may be a good time to start taking a few levels of stamina. Things are going to get harder ahead. Inside the treasure chest, we'll find the silver, and sadly, Watts is going to leave us now. He's going to head back to the dwarf cave, and he'll make us some armor with that silver. He'll also make us a new sword. We will have to buy it from him, though. To be able to pass through the mouth of Gaia, we only need to have one piece of silver equipment, but we are going to want to buy all the silver equipment, so if you don't have much money right now, you may want to focus on fighting a few enemies on your way down to the dwarf cave. For this part, we need to equip our battle axe again, and we have to cut through a few trees. How do we get down there? Oh yeah, okay. We want to get over into this right clearing first, and here, hopefully, this is the gold. No, no, it was the candy. Sometimes it's gonna be the candy. That's just how it goes with these pig warriors. Stupid pig warriors. Head on down here. Busby got me again. And then we're going to head over here. And this is where the dwarf cave is. The dwarf cave in this world is just a small four-room town. It was a lot bigger in Final Fantasy. Over here, we can talk to a few of the other dwarves. This guy says that Watts is selling silver stuff. Yeah, great, that's what we came for. This guy's telling us that the Gaia Pass will lead us to where the airship is, and that's where we need to go next, through that mouth of Gaia. If we come down here, this is what we were looking for. Watts made some things out of that silver. It's time to go shopping. The silver armor is obviously nice. It gives us a good plus 10 defense. And you can see that that plus 11 that we're getting from our bronze helmet is so high compared to all the other things that we can have in the early part of the game. Getting the silver shield is nice. That'll give us an improved ability to be able to block more types of projectiles. But the silver sword is probably the most important of the three here. Plus 14 attack is nice, but also a lot of those enemies that we were only able to damage with magic before will actually be killable using a silver sword. So silver sword I think is a must. If you're a little bit short on money, don't forget that you can equip some of the new items and sell back the old stuff that you had to Watts. That may give you enough money to put you over the edge and be able to buy one of the last pieces that you need. So if we sell back the iron armor, for instance, we're going to get 157 gold pieces. That's quite a bit. And 92 for the iron shield isn't bad either. We didn't even have to buy that one. Once our shopping is all squared away, we can head over here into this room where we can talk to a few more people. Hi, Watts made the silver stuff. Yeah, we know, man. And this guy tells us a little bit more about the mouth of Gaia. It just likes silver things. Super weird. But hey, that's how this game works. Don't want to talk to this guy again. Alright, let's head back to the stairs and make our way to the mouth of Gaia. It's not very far from here. Well, you can see right away how awesome the silver sword is. Just knocking out these pig warriors. Still having some struggles with the buzz bees, but they can't deal us a ton of damage. And we're just gonna make our way up into this cave that has like a face on it. If you don't have any silver stuff equipped, you will be spit out of this cave. Otherwise, you'll be able to pass through no problem. Now that we're in here, we can take out some of these enemies. And there's only four rooms in this cave, although this one is kind of a puzzle room. When you pass between these statues, it makes the door open or close, so all you need to do is just sort of step in between the statues and quickly step back down. Really that simple. And that's it. We've done it. We've passed through the mouth of Gaia. Hmm. Really tough one there. Before we go, though, it seems that we've run into Bogard again. And this time, Bogard's actually going to join our team and fight on our side. This is quite awesome. Thanks for coming along, Bogard. He also says something here about Julius being good at disguising himself. 
which definitely seems like a suspicious thing to say, and now I'm a little bit suspect of you, Bogard. Are you actually Julius in disguise? Tell me something only Bogard would know. It doesn't seem like this Bogard guy is an imposter, and if we ask him just to be safe, he says that Gemma Knights can use the special power of weapons. Try and see it when your willpower is full. Is that something Julius would know? Maybe this is Bogard. In this room, we need to switch back to the axe, so we didn't have really a lot of chance to check out the silver sword before having to switch back. But we need to get over to the left side, so just chop through the trees and chop through any werewolves that you see as well. We leveled up, we'll grab another level of power, and this is a great place to grind levels. Look how easy it is to fight these werewolves here. Number one, four werewolves always spawn on this screen. Usually whenever you clear all the enemies on a single screen, they'll stop spawning unless you save and reload the game or you walk kind of far away and come back. But not werewolves. Werewolves always spawn four werewolves every time. I don't know why it works that way. Also, they always spawn over here on the left side in a nice group, so you should be able to easily kill multiple werewolves at the same time, which will get you just a ton of experience points. Werewolves are worth 48 experience points each, so if you kill all four, that's almost 200 experience points each time. And they also drop these cure potions, which we're gonna start filling up our inventory and not be able to pick them up anymore, but they are nice to have. They're not as good as ethers, which will turn into lots of cures through our MP, but cure potions aren't the worst and we will be able to sell them for money later if we don't need them. So just hang out here and I recommend trying to build up to level 16 or 17, maybe even 18 or 19. You can level up so fast here that you may want to take advantage of it and just build up a few. Let's see, that brings us to level 15. We'll grab another level of power here. And we'll just keep going with these werewolves. Something that you'll also notice in this area is that over to the left there's some of those steamed crab enemies. While you're fighting the werewolves, you may want to fight a steamed crab here and there and see if it'll drop a treasure chest for you. Before we move on to the next area, it's a good idea to get at least one nectar item from the steamed crab enemies in this area. We are going to use that nectar later in the game, so you'll be happy that you had it. For now though, I'm just going to focus on busting these wolves, and each time we level up and put another point into power, it just gets easier to level up the next time. So here we are at level 16, our power is at 29 now, and yeah, we have time to do one more level here with the werewolves, but if you're getting tired of level grinding, feel free to move on whenever you reach level 16, you'll probably be fine later. Still though, level 17 or 18, probably better. And something that might happen to you when you're fighting the werewolves is that you'll get hit by the dark affliction. Don't worry too much about that. You should still be able to see the enemies even when the dark affliction is affecting you. This won't be the last time when you find a room full of werewolves like this. So if you ever feel under leveled and you see one of these rooms, just take the time to keep clearing the werewolves just like in this room, they always spawn four at a time, and they always spawn on the left side. And oh look, the steam crab dropped the nectar item we were looking for. Everything is coming up Kylo. Let's throw away something we don't need, one of these superfluous cures we can just use. And there's the nectar, which will double our damage for a short time whenever we use it, and we are going to use it later in the game. Now up here there's an inn. You probably don't need it because whenever you gain a level, you automatically gain full health. But if you do, it's available to you. Take out these enemies and we're going to use our battle axe to go through the trees on the left. Over on the left side, in addition to the inn in this area, there's also a store. But don't get too excited. 
They do sell a silver helmet there, which will complete our set of silver stuff. But the silver helmet only gives plus 8 defense. And the bronze helmet that we glitched at the beginning of the game is still giving us a nice plus 11. So we will not be needing the silver helmet. Save your money. If you need an ether though, you can buy ethers now, so that's kind of cool. Feel free to pick up a few of those. And then make your way back the way that we came towards the end. We need to go to the right to get to where we need to go. From this screen, the inn is directly below us, but we're going to head over to the right, and we're just going to go through this turnip. Get out of here, turnip. And whenever you see these needle lion enemies, sometimes they drop gold, and you know that gold can be sold for 750 gold pieces, so that's always worth picking up whenever you see it. So we'll grab that gold, make our way up here, we can take out these two water thugs, and then we need to equip our battle axe so that we can chop through these trees on the right. So get that axe out, chop, chop, chop through the trees, and on the other side you'll see a familiar post, and we need to use our chain flail here, but it doesn't seem to reach. Now remember what Bogard said whenever we asked him? Geminites can use the special ability of weapons whenever their will meter is full, and the special ability of the chain flail is that it has enhanced range, so we just need to wait for a full will meter to be able to cross. That's something that we're going to have to do several times in some of the dungeons ahead. Make your way up here, climb down this vine, and head down to the lower area where you can swing across on that pole. And then we're back at this room with the two water thugs again. And if we head up here and go north one more screen, we've done it. We've made it to the airship. The first thing that we need to do whenever we get onto the airship is locate Ray. Until we speak with Ray, we will not be able to leave at the exit. So even if you go all the way to the exit, if you didn't talk to Ray first, she won't be there waiting for us. I'm hoping that this pig warrior dropped gold and not candy. Yeah, of course it was the candy. And something that you may not know is that you can actually kill most of the NPCs in this game. This guy, who says a girl is being held hostage on this airship, and who may be complicit in kidnapping Ray, is somebody that we can definitely kill. It may seem like you have to hit him an inordinate number of times, and you do, but you can kill about 90% of the NPCs in this game. So just keep beating on him and you'll see it happen eventually. And there's his last words. A girl's being held in a room on this airship! And we'll head into this room whenever we're done doing that. That's certainly not something that's required of you, but just something that I wanted to show. And we may need to use our silver sword to fight a lot of the enemies in here. You remember these slimes that we weren't able to kill before without using magic? Well, now we can kill them with a silver sword. The skeleton dropped some more keys for us, and you may think that we have enough keys, but you'll be surprised at how many keys we will need to finish this game. So don't feel like having four sets is too many. It probably isn't. Yeah, well, maybe five sets is too many. So we'll get rid of our smallest set of keys and we'll switch them out for some Maddox, which we might need those too. And this enemy, this eye spy, he can hit you with something that will turn you to stone and that's very obnoxious. And sometimes he can even transform you into a Moogle and if you get turned into a Moogle, that can be a total disaster because if you get hit by any enemies while you're a Moogle, it's as if your defense is at zero, so you are highly likely to take a ton of damage or just get killed. Killing these ghosts can be a good idea, they often drop ethers. And here's another guy, he tells us to get back to work. Huh, maybe I should have made an example out of killing him. Here's some more of those eye spies, and oh no, we got turned into the Moogle. Try to make our way to the stairs and get to safety, and we'll just wait for it to wear off. All right, don't mess around if you're turned into a Moogle. Do whatever you can to wear it off. And here's some enemies that should be easy to kill now. 
and they certainly were. Silly pumpkin bombs. In this room, we can actually kill all of those werewolves before we hit the switch on the right side. And if we do that, well, they won't be able to attack us. If we hit the switch on the right first, they'll all be released. So use your chain flail, and you see that some of the werewolves can slowly walk through the walls, but you should be able to easily finish them off. Open up the gate on the left side, and then hit that switch up there to reveal the stairs. So we're down the stairs, and then we're going to head to the left. There's another person in the bowels of the ship here, and whenever we talk to this guy, we find out that Julius is taking the charge of this airship. And so does that mean that maybe that guy we killed on the upper deck wasn't part of the kidnapping plot? Hmm, well, in any case, we need to use a key here and go through the door at the bottom, and this is the room that we were looking for. We found Ray. Unfortunately, she can't get through that small set of bars right there, so instead we're going to need to bust her out through the window at the back of the room, which seems to have the same set of bars on it. Hey, it doesn't make a lot of sense, but that's what we gotta do. From the sound of things, the airship has taken off, so now we have nowhere to go. Also, Bogard isn't coming with us. We're now on a solo mission. If we use another key, we can go through the door at the top of the room, and that door takes us to a room that has a bed in it, and there's also a bunch of werewolves in here. If we go up to that bed, we'll be able to restore our health and our magic points. Oh, we just leveled up, so we don't actually need the bed anymore. But you'll see that you don't even have to fight the werewolves. They'll still be there whenever you wake back up, and you can just resume beating on them. And that guy dropped another cure for us. See if there's any items we don't need. We can get rid of this mattock that only has four on it. I think seven's going to be enough. We'll see how that turns out. And we'll head down here. You'll notice that our silver sword is very effective against those zombies that we weren't able to kill before without using magic. So we're just gonna head back the way that we came. Watch out for these eye spies. You know that Moogle move they do is dangerous. They also drop ethers though, so we always like the opportunity to pick up a good ether. We can just throw away this pure potion, we're not gonna need that. We have the heal spell now, which kinda makes the pure potions worthless. So we'll head up here. And this time in this room, we're going to go to the left. We went down the previous time. And from this stairway, that's going to take us to letter C, which is in the upper right corner of the map. And we're going to head down from here. This random guy actually has some interesting information. He tells us that Dark Lord found a baby in a cave at the base of the waterfalls. And that baby was Julius. Oh, so he was a magical orphan baby. We should have known. Make your way all the way to the left, and when you get to the end, we're going to go up in this room. In the next room, we're going to use a mattock to break through the jars on the right side. So we'll use a mattock in here, and oh no, dark, whatever shall we do? Yeah, I don't know what dark is really supposed to accomplish for the enemies. But we can use our mattock here, go through that jar, and we want to take that stairway in the upper right, which will bring us back out onto the deck. And this is where we needed to go. Head around those clouds. Most of the time you would need to use magic to kill the clouds, but now that we have the silver sword, we can kill them without magic. Pretty awesome. Alright, use up some of our cures, because this should also be a cure. And then you can just hit the treasure chest to get it out of the way. And we're going to loop down here. And when we get to the bottom, there's going to be a ladder. Watch out for all the werewolves. And just make your way to the bottom of the ladder. That is the end of the airship. There's no boss this time, but don't get used to that. There are going to be a lot more bosses in this game. 
Now that we made it to the window, it seems like Ray isn't ready to go. She just hands us the pendant, but of course Julius has been watching the entire time. He hits Kylo with a fireball, knocking him to the edge. Hold on, Kylo. But he can't hold on. And he falls. And he falls. And he falls. But what Julius doesn't know is that Kylo's superpower is that extreme falls can't hurt him. We fell much farther before, and we didn't have so much more than an ouch. This time we seem to have been knocked unconscious, and look who came to visit us. It's our friend Amanda from the gladiatorial pits. Hey, what's going on, Amanda? And why is that sinister music playing? Huh. Something seems off here. Yeah, especially now that you're apologizing. What are you about to do, Amanda? When we wake up, it seems that everything is okay, but the pendant is missing. I knew Amanda was acting suspiciously. We're going to have to get it back, but that's the end of part one of this guide. So definitely check out part two, where we'll catch back up with Amanda and find out what she did with the pendant. I'll reveal my secret trick to get tons of money in the later part of the game, and we'll fight so many bosses, including Julius himself. You won't want to miss the epic conclusion in part two. <laughs>